Hey everybody, thank you for joining. This is probably the most important topic for anybody either who owns any crypto or is thinking about buying some because what I'm going to tackle today in this video is the subjects that people will use to convince people not to buy crypto. Now I'm going to analyze all of the risks over all of the categories of what I call Bitcoin killers. Again, the title sounds a little bit ominous. It could be, but again, let's go through this whole uh, journey. Again, I prepared a lot of material and I'm going to start right at the very beginning and talk about quantum computing. Quantum computing is the first thing that people always say, oh, when quantum computers are there, they're going to be able to decode the Bitcoin cryptography. The answer is potentially yes. In fact, experts say that once quantum computers have the processing power of about 2,334 qubits, they will be able to solve the cryptography problem that Bitcoin uses to keep the network safe. Now, what's important to understand is there are some initial quantum computers out there in the world today, but they have about 72 qubits of power. Again, it needs to go to 2,334, and many believe that this will not happen for quite some time. In terms of them solving this cryptography problem, it will not be for the next 10 plus years at least. Some people say 20 years. So let's call it 2030 to 2040. My take is in the meantime, we're going to be safe, but we'll monitor this space very closely. And by the year 2029, that may be time, definitely at the very latest time, to check on the state of quantum computing and where they actually are today. In addition, experts say that quantum computers even if they did exist and did have all that power and used a thing called Grover's algorithm to crack the Bitcoin network, it still wouldn't save that much time. So they're not even sure if it will work. And finally, if it does happen, if a quantum computer exists that can solve cryptography, Bitcoin could be the least for worries because that means these machines will be able to hack into our bank accounts or our medical records, you name it, everything. Criminal records, be able to change your grades in school and a whole bunch of other good stuff. So bear that in mind. Uh, that's kind of what's coming. But there is some more good news as well. I try to spread all the good news as much as I can. So the NIST and many other organizations around the world, they are planning to issue a quantum safe encryption algorithm by the year 2022. This will basically protect certain networks, such as the Bitcoin network, from this type of attack from quantum computing machines. So that's the first topic we're going to touch on today. Second potential Bitcoin killer is what they call the 51% attack. You've all heard about this. Everybody's very nervous. So I'm going to start and kind of talk about all the possibilities and what that actually means. So Jimmy Song, one of the initial advocates and developer on the Bitcoin network, he said in one paragraph, basically two quick sentences. One, centralized production of mining equipment can have a bad outcome. And second, the more dangerous scenario is the concentration of hash power. That means one area having a lot of access to hash power. So let's break these down into two things. First of all, all of the ASIC chips and all of the mining rigs are made pretty much by two companies. One is Bitmain based in Beijing, and the other one is Microbit based in Shenzhen, China. The second thing, about two thirds of the hash power today is in China. So Jimmy Song, if when you're out there, you know, your two biggest risks have come true and that makes him very nervous. So it should make all of us nervous. But as usual, let's go a little bit deeper. Let's talk about what a 51% attack is for those that don't know. And this is when a blockchain like the Bitcoin blockchain is attacked by a group or pool of miners controlling more than 51% of the hash power. So when you look at miners today, there are mining companies and then there are pools of miners that contribute like a co-op and they help each other out. And if, for example, 10 groups of miners create one pool and they get credit for mining and solving algorithms quickly, faster than anybody else, they divvy up the proceeds from that. Basically, what's called a mining reward, which is paid in Bitcoin. So this is all very feasible and can happen. So what is hash power? That is the power your computer or hardware uses to run and solve different hashing algorithms. Very easy. And the, these things are solved using ASIC computers. Again, 
the hardware of which is made in China, and two thirds of the hashing actually happens in China. Let's go a little bit deeper. So today, the top four Chinese mining pools already have and control more than 51% of the hash rate, which is kind of scary to some. In fact, two thirds of global Bitcoin hash rate is concentrated in China. Are you nervous yet? But there's more. So when you look at the hash rate distribution across some of the big pools, you have this huge category here of over a third. They are unknown pools. Then you've got F2 pool, pool in, Huobi pool, etc. These are all big Chinese pools and you can see kind of where they're based. But why do people ask, why are there so much mining operations in China? The answer is electricity is cheap. They have an abundance of things like hydroelectric power. They have cheap labor. <laughs> they have access to the hardware and uh, they got in on the game early. So they have that. Now, the good news is a lot of mining operations are really growing up with scale in other parts of the world. Iceland, Scandinavia, uh, Canada. Uh, you've got countries uh, trying to get in on the game like Pakistan and others. So this is going to hopefully balance out more and take some of the hashing away from China over time. But we'll also monitor that very closely. But let's go a little bit deeper once again. So what happens if you get to 51%? So 51% attack isn't possible with that 51% of the hash rate. So even then, what would the pool do? So they can do a couple of things. They can partition the network. They can do a little bit of double spending and hope nobody notices. That's very important. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a subsequent slide. Double spend. Now, I covered double spend in a previous video a couple of weeks ago when there was some FUD out there, when a group falsely claimed that a double spend issue happened in the amount of about $21. As it turns out, it didn't. And it's never happened in the history of Bitcoin. However, if it did, Bitcoin would go to zero and nobody would trust the Bitcoin network anymore. It is also theoretically possible for it to happen. And the question is, though, why would it happen? Now, what is a double spend real quick? So just imagine you have Bob. Bob has a Bitcoin. Bob sells his Bitcoin to Lisa and buys a Tesla, for example, because Elon Musk will be accepting that as a payment mechanism in the very near future. And at the same time, because they control the network, they can use that same Bitcoin and use a digital copy of it and send it to Alice and buy another Tesla. So you see Bob now has two Teslas for the price of only one Bitcoin. That's a double spend. Again, possible, theoretically possible with a 51% hack. So what else can happen if there is a 51% attack? What else can they do? Well, the attackers can prevent new transactions from getting confirmations. So that means they control the entire system. So they can halt payments between some or all users. And you all understand what that would mean. Imagine halting payments between Starbucks and a credit card processing company. Second thing, they can mine empty blocks. And third, they can double spend, but only for a limited period of time. And it's very, very important to understand. Just a limited period of time. Now, even more importantly is what they can't do. So what they can't do is the attackers can't steal Bitcoin. They can't increase the limit of the Bitcoin supply, the 21 million coins, and they can't hack into Satoshi's stash. So he has over a million Bitcoin, and that's been a target of many for a long time because it's sat idle for 12 years or whatever. So that's the first place somebody would like to go, either with a quantum computer or the 51% attack or whatever else. But again, they can't. So rest at ease in that regard. So what is the net net potential damage? So attackers would be able to reverse transactions that were completed while they were in control of the network, meaning they could double spend coins. That is the damage. So let's talk now, now that we've analyzed in great detail, the damage a 51% attack could do, how can the mechanism protect itself? And that's what they call the power of the consensus mechanisms within the Bitcoin network. And that's all designed. That's part of the genius of Satoshi when he built this whole thing in the first place is how it is structured. So first of all, the number one Bitcoin strength is this guy from a guy called Peter Wuhle. He says one of Bitcoin's strengths and the most important in his opinion is a low degree of trust you need in others. So think about that for a second. You could move $100,000 into the Bitcoin network and download your keys and rest assured there is no human that can actually control it or steal it. So an interesting way to think about the security of the actual platform itself and the network. 
Second thing, Bitcoin governance. Think of it like the US that has three branches of government. The executive branch, the Senate, and the House. Within the Bitcoin network world, you have the full nodes, and they can veto miners and devs. And they can also alert people to problems like, hey, that looks like a fraudulent kind of transaction. Miners can also veto developers, and the developers can help others bypass some vetoes. So these three organizations can all deal and solve certain problems like a 51% attack together. And they can revert back if there is a mistake that happens on the network. They can all work together to reversing it back out and bringing everything back to normal. So the third thing that's very important, and this is getting a little bit too deep into the weeds, but I think it's important to raise up, is what's called civil resistance. And that is honest nodes communicate quickly. So honest nodes on the network, and most of the nodes actually in North America, they can actually identify something that is a civil node, which is doing something bad, and basically undo it. So enforcing the network to actually reverse the transaction. So very, very important concept as well. So let's talk about some more good news. Attackers, uh, again, are unable to create new coins or alter old blocks. And a 51% attack will not destroy Bitcoin or another blockchain, but it might have some initial damage, i.e. double spend, etc. But it can all be reversed back out. And is there any precedent? Has this ever happened before? And the answer is yes, but not with Bitcoin. Very important. It happened with other networks. So Ethereum was hacked in 2016 because of the Krypton and Shift blockchains. They suffered attacks. And then Bitcoin Gold in May 2018, was the, which is the 26th at the time, 26th largest cryptocurrency, they had a malicious attack. Again, 51% attack. And the attackers were able to double spend for days and they stole about $18 million worth of Bitcoin gold. So you can see it can happen, but it's the networks can respond and solve the problem pretty quickly. Back to the how and the why. So simple theory. The cost to conduct a 51% attack is very punitive. And what that means is it requires a lot of coordination, a lot of horsepower, a lot of energy. And at the same time, what you're ultimately going to do is shoot yourself in the foot. So if you imagine a lot of these mining organizations in China that are parts of all these big pools, sometimes that's the biggest business in the village. If these guys coordinate to bring the Bitcoin network down, they destroy their lifestyle and they devalue Bitcoin and they basically all the investments they've made in mining machines and education and equipment and infrastructure gets flushed down the toilet. So that's why, uh, again, extremely punitive to go down this path. And that's one of the many reasons why it probably wouldn't happen. It wouldn't be worth it. So the third and final element is regulation. So can governments destroy and ban Bitcoin? The answer is yes, they can try, but they will not succeed. I uh, placed a video on this subject a week or two ago, and you can check it out in my videos. I'll put a card here in the description as well. But it's so funny because uh, two professors from Nigeria uh, immediately talked about the workarounds that they were working on in the country, and they'd already solved the banning by the Nigerian government. So again, you can't ban it, you can't stop it, you can't 51% attack it. But as usual, you're here for the conclusion, so thank you for still being here. So first of all, in summary, quantum computing. Can quantum computing crack Bitcoin encryption? The answer is uh, maybe between 2030 and 2040. We're not sure. But the network can make quantum safe by upgrades. And if, if there are these quantum computers out there, we probably will have bigger issues to worry about. But consider the next 10 years being pretty safe. Very safe. 99.9% .9 safe. Second issue. 51% attack. Is it possible? Yes, it is, but it's unlikely. And the impetus to do it defies logic and human motivations. Therefore, in my opinion, yes, it's theoretically possible. Is it going to happen? Hell no. Makes no sense. Even with the hardware being created in China, the Apache power concentration in China and everything else, China isn't going to attack this network. It just means too much to the country right now. Third, regulation. If you saw my previous video regarding Bitcoin banned, the answer is no, it can't be banned. And remember, think about the spider and the starfish. 
you can cut off the head of a spider, but Bitcoin is like a starfish. You can chop off a limb, it'll grow back. You can cut it in two, it becomes two starfish. And that is the beauty of the decentralized structure. So, in summary, we are safe, at least for the next 10 years. Uh, of course, we'll keep up on top of this every week, every month. As soon as there's new developments, you'll be the first to hear. So if you like this content, please subscribe, hit the like. And again, this is very, very important. I didn't want to alarm anybody, but it's very important to be real with the facts. But there's nothing to be worried about at all, at least for the next eight to 10 years, let's say. A uh, big thank you to all the Patreon members. If you're interested in getting inside my head and having a Swiss Army knife in your back pocket, that's Invest Answers from Patreon. And finally, scammers, I'm in the black bubble. Watch them, they're everywhere. Every hour they pop up and try to reply to your comments, so just ignore them all. Thank you all, love you all, take care.